What's up guys, on today's episode we're working on my wife's Subaru Outback, what I affectionately call the baby mobile, and we're gonna do a spring cleaning. Now last year I did a crazy spring cleaning episode, the link is up here if you wanna see it, where I jacked the car up, took the wheels off, cleaned the undercarriage, and went completely insane. Uh, a lot of you have emailed me and said, hey, that was super cool, but how do we do something on our car that doesn't take all day? I just wanna spend an hour or two, so I heard you loud and clear, we're gonna go over that today. Number two, you asked, if I don't have pressure washers and foamers and special undercarriage cleaners and all these fancy professional tools, how do I get the same kind of clean with the tools that I have around my house? I said, okay, I got you there. And then third, my favorite question was the process flow. How do we work around the car in, in what kind of manner to increase the effectiveness and efficiency, meaning I wanna shrink the amount of time. Basically, you're, you're asking me, with all these three questions, how do I do a really good spring cleaning, but I don't wanna spend you know, three days doing it. And I heard you loud and clear, so today's episode is gonna focus specifically on that. So that and a lot more coming up on this special spring cleaning episode of Drive and Protect. Uh, all the way in. So they, uh, touch on pain. I can hear it. So I would say the biggest question I get about cleaning is whether to work on the outside of the car first or the inside of the car first. Typically, it doesn't really matter. Now, we're doing a spring cleaning, so we're not polishing the paint, but if you were to polish or abrade or restore the paint, I prefer to do the inside first and then focus all my time and energy on the outside. Sometimes I change that up depending on the weather and whether I can work inside, that kind of thing. So push all that to the side. But for this car on a spring cleaning, if you have to introduce moisture, meaning you know, carpet cleaners and that kind of thing, you want to allow as much time as possible for it to wick out, to, for it to dry. My wife's seat has some stains on it, the baby's seat has some stains, so I'm gonna to have to introduce some of those moisture cleaning carpet kind of things, right? So if I scrub that, I wanna give it as much time as possible to give it back to the customer. Again, in this case, it's my wife, so it's even more important to not have, you know, have somebody sit down and have a wet butt or you know, jeans all kind of soaked, that kind of thing. So keep that in mind. That's how I determine whether I'm doing the inside or outside. So in this case, because I'm introducing that, I'm gonna start with the interior first. So with that, let's move quickly. Process flow number one being the interior, we first need to remove everything from inside the car, the trunk, and the rubber mats if you have them. Next, use your favorite plastic, leather, and vinyl cleaner on the doors, steering wheel, and the dashboard. Then work your way down from the radio to the center console. If you have an interior brush, it can be helpful in those tight spots. I also find it easier to leave the seats and floors for the very last step within the interior to avoid leaving junk from your shoes on the carpet and sitting on a wet seat. Likewise, if you have compressed air, use it. Air is your friend here. If not, use a computer aerosol duster for the vents and the tight spots, or you can just skip it all together. After the cup holders, switch to the passenger side door and work the other two doors if you happen to have a four door. Next, locate any stains on your seats. If you have leather, then use a specific leather cleaner. If you have fabric, Alcantara, or carpet, use a specific fabric cleaner. In other words, avoid using any all-purpose cleaners on these types of material. Here's a link to a video explaining why those types of cleaners should not be used on your interior. Now, because I do this all day long, I actually put my shag fabric cleaner in the aerator to create foam in a wide pattern to avoid over soaking the material, especially because it's my wife's car and she's gonna use it immediately once I'm done so there isn't a lot of time to dry. You can use your favorite cleaner direct from the bottle or even use warm water in a very mild laundry detergent that you have at your house. The goal here is to actually clean the material using the least amount of extra or what I would say excess moisture possible. For the back seat, I actually had to vacuum up the extra dirt from my son's feet first before scrubbing to avoid pushing that extra dirt into the fabric. It's easier to see what's a stain and what's just the surface dirt, so vacuum first if it's really heavy. Notice these spots right here. It doesn't look that great on camera, nor does it look good in person because the darker spots are actually wet or moisture areas. Once they dry, it'll look perfect, or you may need to go back and scrub it again. The point is, it's very hard to know if you did a quality cleaning until it's actually dry. The last step for the interior is to vacuum up everything, including the seats that you just cleaned, to help pick up anything that you may have agitated or brought to the surface of the fabric, and to help remove the moisture. While I'm in the footwell, I clean the pedals as well with plastic cleaner, wipe really well, and then vacuum the grooves out. Do not put trim shine or dressings on plastic, rubber, or pedals in this area. More on this later. 
Process flow number two is the engine. You can simply rinse it with a hose, a pressure washer, an aerator, or just wipe with a damp towel. In my case, I filled the aerator with 40 ounces of warm water, added brute wheel soap, and applied a light even coating. Then used my wheel brush on the jams and removed many winter leaves from random hidden spots. Next, rinsed the cleaner, then dried with a wheel towel. Feel free to use compressed air if you have it. If not, just move on. While you're there, take 10 seconds and check your air filter before closing the hood. Process flow number three is the wheels. Okay, after the interior and the engine, up next, of course, is the wheels. There's a thousand different options, but the moral of the story is this. Use as much lubrication as possible, especially on the paint and, of course, the wheels. You can use a pressure washer with a foamer. That's very popular and cool, but again, on the expensive side, if you don't have that, you just have a hose. You can rinse it down with a normal hose and then put your wheel cleaner. This is Brute in the aerator, and it acts just like the foamer. You kind of get the same thing for not spending all that money on the, on the pressure washer. Totally cool. If you don't have access to water at all or it's really cold or you're in an apartment or a drought area, you can use Frothy. I'll post a link up here and do the entire thing with a, a hoseless or waterless wash. That's cool. If you have a slop sink and you can fill this up, meaning a five gallon bucket with some warm water, that'll help you. Again, add as much lubrication as possible. So pick the option that works best for you. Step one is to rinse the wheel if you have access to water. Next, add your cleaners and lubricants. In this case, I have a mixture of Brute and Boost in the aerator. Let it dwell for about 30 seconds, then start with the wheel woolly on the back side of the rim, then brush the front, and finally the rubber. I typically only use a stiff bristle brush on the rubber once or maybe twice a year. As you can see, the cleaner is turning brown after a winter's worth of driving. Then scrub the wheel wells if you can reach them, and heavily rinse with water. If you're not working with water, then you can use multiple wheel towels to lift and remove the frothy. Repeat the process on all four wheels. As for the rubber floor mats, I clean them with the same tools from the wheel bucket. Simply rinse, scrub with a brush, and then rinse again is usually all that's required. Avoid heavy APCs or solvent cleaners as they can damage or dry out the rubber. Likewise, never put any trim shines or dressings on the mat. Yes, the mat will look deeper or shinier, but at what cost? Even if it's buffed dry, some dressings get reactivated because of your wet shoes when you get in the car, and they'll become slick again, so don't risk it. Process flow number four is the subframe. There are many new elaborate subframe cleaning apparatuses out there that look fun, but probably are more suited to the professional or multi-car per day user to justify the cost. But it's definitely a good option for those professional shops in high rolled salt areas. First is to use a power washer with the wand and simply get under your car and blast away. Without a pressure washer, use an aerator and boost to dissolve the undercarriage salt. You can also use a regular garden hose on shower mode and flip the trigger lock to keep the valve open. Then tape it to a broomstick, lay it under the car, and then turn on the water from the spigot. You can reach the innermost part of the subframe without laying under the car and getting wet. Process flow number five is the paint. First, spray the car with a power washer or hose or the hoseless aerator depending on your situation to remove the majority of the dirt. Then fill a bucket half full with warm water and add a few squirts of boost. Next, add four or five towels to the water and agitate with your hose or washer to create suds. Then, if available, foam gun the paint or use the aerator to apply the first layer of soap and winter boost. Allow to dwell for one to two minutes, then remove one towel from your bucket, fold it into fours, and wipe the paint working from top to bottom. Be sure to refold the towel as it becomes dirty. Once all sides are dirty, wring it out and place it in your dirty catch bucket and start with a fresh towel again. Repeat this process until all the painted surfaces are cleaned, never redunking your towel into the original boost mixture again. The rule of thumb is this, once a clean towel comes out of the clean bucket, it never goes back in again. This will help you avoid any cross-contamination. Then rinse the paint and dry with a damp microfiber towel and hydrate. Do not use squeegees, chamois, or beach towels. Process flow number six is the door jams. To clean the jams, you can use just a towel, spray wax and a towel, or a mixture of boost, a brush, and compressed air, depending on how crazy you want to get and how much time you have for the job. But either way, none of the options are really time consuming, but they are very important as this is a hot spot for oxidation. Here is a link to a crazy door jam video should you have the time and the ambition. Step seven is protection. 
Although it's a bit more time consuming, it's a very important step after winter and approaching the increasing UV light season. It took about 20 to 25 minutes if you move quickly. Okay, hang in there. We got two steps left. We're almost done. We just finished up the sealant and the car looks amazing. Now we're going to be focusing on glass next and then trim at the end, meaning the tires and of course the black trim on the bottom of the car. The reason we do that last is if we introduce any petroleums or solvents or lubricant, anything like that, and then we go clean the glass, we have a chance of introducing something and then having streaks everywhere and glass is just kind of a, a nightmare. On that topic, I used to do a three towel method. The first towel was just to clean off, kind of scoop off as much junk as you could. The second one was to clean the glass and the third one was to pick up any trailers. And so I had all these towels on there and it was, it's a pretty good method. It's not, it's not terrible. Glass is kind of a nightmare uh, for detailers. It just, it, there's always something wrong. In the past few episodes, I introduced a tool like this. This one is a, it's like a dollar or two. It's a three M little squeegee thing. And this one here is for window tinters. Now the window tinter, what I would do is I'd, I'd watch one of my buddies. They have to have the glass absolutely perfect because if you put a piece of tint on and there's a little dust or a streak or whatever, that's it, it's gonna be there and then the customer's not gonna like it. You have to peel it off, it costs a lot of money. So these guys really focus hard. So I was watching them and they were using this tool and I'm trying to figure out why is this tool so effective? And I, I get the idea of a squeegee, but with respect to a microfiber towel, I was thinking, okay, with all these hooks and loops in a microfiber towel, there's some gaps and things in there and maybe it's not making full perfect contact with the glass. I don't know if you guys have comments, leave them below. But the moral of the story is what I'm finding is that it's working really well for me now, especially on Porsches that have uh, there's no trim right here. There's just a piece of glass all the way up. You can take this and just run it up the side of the glass and, it, and it's perfect. The only thing you need to do with this is manage the amount of uh, cleaner that you have dripping down. So I actually do it on the inside of the glass too and make sure I put a few towels here and there and just you know, scoop up the, the little bit of drips that you're gonna get and don't let it you know, go somewhere where you don't want it to go. So window cleaner on, give yourself a pretty good amount. Don't go nuts. Take this, just regular squeegee, right? And I, I like to just touch, so, I, so I'm managing the, the, the uh, drips here. I go like this, touch, like this, touch, and just overlapping. Again, it's not rocket science, but because it's so small, you can really manipulate this thing. And then once, see there's little drips and whatnot all over the place? I just go in with the towel at that point and just buff off the rest of it. And to me, it's showing that it's getting off the, the things that I normally can't with the three towel method. And it's, it's actually way faster and it's more effective. I think the pressure, I'm, I'm always you know, in the middle of the night thinking of these wacky things. I think it's just the pressure and the rubber. There's nowhere like here where there's always little gaps and things, which is what we want for picking up you know, wax or whatever. But on glass, this is super hard. You want that rubber all the way touch as hard as you can and then squeeze it. There's just no room for it and then I think you know, the little bit of fingerprints or, you know, the oils and whatever just kind of squeezes, it kind of pushes itself out under the pressure of the squeegee. But maybe I'm overthinking it, I don't know. But the moral of the story is this thing kicks butt, it's $2 and you can do glass and not want to like freak out every time you do it. So let's do it. Now our last step, process flow number nine, is protecting and moisturizing the rubber and the trim. Be sure to massage the tire gel moisturizer into the rubber and allow it to penetrate, especially after a heavy stiff bristle brush cleaning. Keep in mind that two coats may be required after this thorough cleaning. Then work your way around the car and apply dressing from the same applicator to any black plastic trim or wheel wells for extra pop or contrast with the paint and to add some hydrophobic characteristics to the lower parts of the car that tend to get dirtier quicker. Well guys, that's it. We're done and the car looks amazing. My wife came out and she loved it, so that makes me very happy. Now, uh, two quick things. We can shrink the process a little bit if you guys need to. The first thing I would I recommend is maybe not doing the engine. I still think you should, but if you needed to pull some time, that was where I would uh, probably pull it. Just rinse it down real quick and wipe it with a towel. It takes you a minute or two, but you can get rid of that. Number, number two is putting on the uh, trim shine. Everything from all these black spots right here to the tires themselves. Some people like the shine, some people don't, but I will give you a little bit of a heads up or an asterisk, if you will. Once a year, maybe twice a year, I will scrub down the rubber, meaning the tires, like I did with that red short handle stiff bristle brush. Um, and you saw it turn brown. It's just gross at the end of winter. And I'm kind of pulling all that out of the pores, if you will. So when you go back in and you do put tire shine and moisturize and kind of keep that rubber supple, that's why I tend to not use all purpose cleaners on a lot of rubber. Sometimes it will make them brittle. 
Um, so when you put tire shine on, it's going to absorb because you've just cleaned out all the pores and there's no layers of, of your previous tire shine on there, right? That makes sense. So when you put your first layer on, it absorbs really fast and it'll, it'll just go into uh, the tire and it won't be very shiny like this. Once you put the second one on, you're just building layers and it'll look good. Going forward now, I'm not typically going to scrub the rubber like uh, I did on this one. So I'll clean it down. I'll use a little bit of brush, just kind of, if there's any mud or anything uh, in the cracks and the creases and all that, I'll get that out. But I'm not gonna sit there and just scrub it like crazy. I'll just put another layer of mud on there and just build up the shine. And it takes two seconds to put the tire shine on. This one took multiple times because I scrubbed it so much. Does that make sense? So keep that in mind when you're doing it uh, in terms of time. So I wanted to make sure that we were focused on time here. But otherwise, uh, if I wasn't filming, I'm sure it would take between an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and I had a good time and the car looks great. Uh, the glass, more importantly, is clean and I, we really picked up a lot of time with that squeegee thing. So that's kind of a fun little uh, thing I've been playing with for the last little while. But anyways, guys, hope you enjoy it. Uh, I can't wait for spring and thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.